This one is big news. Uh, it's a couple days old already, but it took me a while to go through all of the data and try and condense it down into an announcement in layman's terms, so you may have already heard it. Essentially, we now have initial evidence of plasmoids in the system. The simplest way to explain what's going on is to use the plasma globe as an example. Um, everyone will have seen one of these before. They were developed by some students at MIT about 50 or so years ago based on Nikola Tesla's plasma lamp um, and the plasma arcing observed from the sphere or the toroidal load uh, that he placed on top of the secondary coil of his Tesla coil circuit. And the plasma globe was a glass sphere filled with noble gases uh, with a high voltage electrode sphere nested within it. And due to the high charge differential between the inner and the outer sphere, uh, plasma filaments extend from the inner electrode to the outer glass insulator when the power is turned on. And the effect is beautiful, uh, and these globes were rather popular in the 80s, you can still find them at kind of $2 shops and stuff now. Uh, we see these moving tendrils of illuminating plasma, and uh, we're even able to interact with them through the glass when you touch the sphere or put your hand near uh, this latest macro photography from Martin Fleischman Memorial Project shows us that we are seeing evidence of the same phenomena uh, occurring between the spheres of the thunderstorm generator. Uh, and not just evidence that there are plasma filaments arcing between the spheres, uh, but that there are large, stable, homeostatic clusters of plasma, plasmoids. But let's jump back a bit and tell the full story here. Uh, Bob Grainyar of the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project recently visited Malcolm Bendel in the UK to conduct some macro photography on the first original thunderstorm generator sphere samples. Uh, I published a few updates on the build guide regarding some of Bob's other observations from that video previously, uh, but this video is to cover the truly significant observation that was made during those sessions. So when Malcolm publicly revealed the thunderstorm generator at Tesla Tech a few months ago, uh, he made some absolutely huge claims about thunderstorms and plasmoids. And of course, speculators, they went wild. Uh, lots of controversy. I've had hundreds of comments of people explaining what they believe is going on in the system to cause the dramatic reduction of carbon gases from the exhaust and their apparent transmutation into oxygen, hydrogen, and other elements. You know, it's just water vapor, it's just the pipe, it's just the gate, etc, etc. Um, however, in my own opinion, as I have stated quite relentlessly, uh, absolutely none of these reasons come even close to accounting for the full results that have been obtained so far. The thunderstorm generator is doing what no previous invention that I am aware of has done before in terms of its efficiency and its simplicity in parts. Um, and in the reliability of the results being obtained, um, even from less ideal prototypes. It's the makeup of the thing. Bob's recent analysis of the macro photography of the inside of the outer sphere and the outside of the inner sphere from the retrofit uh, provide us with some startlingly clear evidence that plasmoid or ball lightning phenomena is occurring within the thunderstorm generator unit. And what he is seeing correlates with the results of a host of previous significant experiments performed by scientists studying plasmoids in physics historically. Essentially, Malcolm is 100% correct in his initial claim, or that's what these results indicate. There are plasmoids in the system that are doing the majority of the work, and the structures are highly suggestive of this phenomena, to say the least, can clearly be seen in Bob's analysis of this sample. The thunderstorm generator is producing plasmoids on a large scale. And what's more, they're embedding themselves in the metal of the spheres of the units. Or again, this is what this indicates. I've received confirmation from a handful of people now that once the units have been conditioned for some time, uh, such as this eight-year-old original prototype, then the thunderstorm generator retrofit and even the engine can become embedded with plasmoids and continue to operate with significantly reduced carbon reductions even after the bubbler has been completely disconnected or the valve turned off. The plasmoids are causing a permanent change in the metal spheres over time, uh, and they appear to be embedding themselves within the structure, again, as Malcolm's original claims. Anyway, let's delve into Bob's analysis and cover the key points from his initial groundbreaking findings. What we're going to be looking at is these two parts of the thunderstorm generator, the nested spheres. The spheres are being analyzed here are the large pair from the Perkins gas generator in the UK. That's what they've been used recently for. Um, they were actually manufactured eight years ago by Malcolm and the team working on 
a previous prototype, um, and they've been run on several large generators for some hundreds of hours, so that's their history. The analysis was done on the outside of the inner sphere and the inside of the outer sphere, so you know they're facing into that same cavity. We see these pockmark or leopard print-like patterns, uh, and this is the most significant observation here. Um, however, it's also curious that we can see many crystals and these other structures forming. And Bob touches on the likelihood of what these structures could be, and I'll show a couple here a bit later uh, for an example, but he plans to perform further analysis under the SEM uh, to provide us with the facts, so I'll hold off on going too much into the elemental composition of these varying structures too much until then. Um, we've got some strong indications, but we're going to find out. Um, so it's this pockmark pattern that really interests us here. We can see when we zoom in on this pattern on the inner sphere that there are darker brown spots uh, surrounded by lighter rings. And there's a polygonal kind of nature uh, to many of these structures, uh, but it's perhaps less clear here. Um, it can perhaps be seen a little better in the zoomed out image here. We can see these toroidal polygonal structures even more clearly on the inside of the outer sphere. Bob has roughly mapped out how many sides um, he can count on a group of these structures. And so you can see here that the majority have six sides um, by his counting. Um, but some have eight, some have five. There's a number, but the majority have six sides. Um, it's less clear on some because of the angles of the photos, but it's crystal clear on many of them, um, easily enough to make an accurate call on this one. So the reason these structures are so significant is because they're consistent with those observed in a number of other major plasmoid or ball lightning experiments. Uh, they're essentially considered as highly suggestive evidence of plasmoids being present in the system and embedded in the metal, um, consistent with the other significant research in this field. So Bob first shows how these structures we observe on the outer and the inner sphere appear to be to uh, clearly resemble those that uh, Matsumoto observed caused by ball lightning striking a metal plate, uh, published in his 2000 paper, Steps to the Discovery of Electronuclear Collapse. Uh, he notes that we find millions of these uh, on the thunderstorm generator spheres, uh, evidence of plasmoids occurring on a large scale. So it's worth going and checking out Matsumoto's uh, papers. He Bob references them a lot in this video, um, and he draws a lot of correlations there. And on the inside of the outer sphere, we can observe structures with a similar geometry, but it's totally different again. Um, it's very black. It appears that the inside of the outer sphere is coated in a film of carbon soot, while the outside of the inner sphere seems to be completely free of carbon. By analyzing a fingerprint that was left on the sphere and calculating the approximate length between the gap between the ridges uh, for a male, who was most likely to have handled the unit, uh, approximately... 0.46 millimeters, Bob was able to fairly accurately approximate the diameter of the dark spot structure you see here within the fingerprint uh, to be around 1.5 to 1.7 millimeters. So this is a good sample that represents a number of these structures, um, although there are many varying sizes here. Bob notes that this size correlates with uh, the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project's 2020 analysis of John Hutchinson's sample. Uh, which had a diameter of 1.6 millimeters, uh, and also those of Bob Danovich. So like I say, uh, Bob gives a lot of references during this video, reads through some papers um, of things that are consistent with what he's seeing here, and there's a fair bit. Um, he references the Vega experiments uh, performed by MFMP and Hank, uh, the MFMP analysis of the Hutchison sample, uh, the plasma flow discharge system experiments of Bogdanovich and the work of uh, Dr. Anatoly Klimov um, and of course of Matsumoto who we mentioned earlier uh, as well as some others and the historical data is strongly indicating uh, that what we're seeing here within the sphere of the thunderstorm generator is a direct result of plasmoid or charge cluster or ball lightning phenomena uh, and also strongly indicative of the plasmoids being embedded or bound within the crystal structure of the metal of the sphere, um, becoming bound there over time. So long-lasting, stable plasmoids. So to recap, uh, we see this polygonal pockmark-looking structure uh, on both the inside of the outer sphere and the outside of the inner sphere. Um, we see a lot of them. And these structures are consistent with the structures observed on 
meddling historical experiments involving plasmoids. And then the inside of the outer sphere is coated with a layer of carbon soot, uh, appearing visibly black, while the outside of the inner sphere is free of soot. And this, again, is consistent with the data obtained from the trials of many other systems um, intended to produce plasmoids, which Bob references in his video. And why is this happening? Um, according to what Matsumoto observed, a, a black hole, when it explodes, generates a carbon film. Uh, whatever goes in, it synthesizes a carbon film uh, when it comes out of the black hole. And of course, we know that the plasmoids contain a black hole, this zero point at the center, uh, which is condensing matter in this way and blowing it out again the other side. At the point of electronuclear collapse, uh, anything going through the wormhole and coming out of the white hole on the opposite side generally comes out as different elements. Um, the lighter elements such as oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon, etc., uh, on the outside, and the heavier elements, such as titanium and iron, etc., on the inside. And again, this is what we're seeing here in these two photos. Uh, the inside of the outer sphere and the outside of the inner sphere are exposed to the same cavity, but one is coated in carbon soot uh, with quite large crystal structures visible to the naked eye in sunlight, while the other is free of soot, uh, and the structures appear to have an entirely different elemental makeup we're seeing. So Bob has requested to take a cutout sample um, of the two spheres so that it can be thoroughly examined more closely under the electron microscope. So we hope to see some conclusive data on the elemental makeup of these structures in the near future. So I've really only given you a brief summary of all of this here. Um, you can go and check out about three hours of live video with Bob going through his entire analysis, uh, showing a bunch of interesting structures that he aims to examine under the SCM. Um, and he also spends some time going through the papers he references, uh, as usual. You'll pick up some very interesting facts and leads from Bob if you take the time to go through those videos in full. And I've linked to the references Bob has provided in the description of this video too, so you can go and check out what uh, they had to say for yourself. There's a lot about plasmoids in there. But once again, we can sum all of this up very simple in form and function. Uh, it works similarly to what we observe in the plasma globe. There's a high charge differential between the spheres, in the case of the thunderstorm generator, a uh, high net positive charge on the outer sphere, and high net negative charge on the inner sphere. And this is all it takes to trigger a thunderstorm, um, assuming the spheres are correct ratio to one another for the event to optimally occur. Structured plasma forms, uh, the filaments connecting the two spheres, uh, matter and energy is absorbed by the plasmoid, uh, passing through its plane of inertia, its zero point or black hole, and the excess protons are again being spat out at either end uh, as a variety of different elements, different on each side. And we see the evidence of this in the structures deposited and embedded on both the inside of the outer sphere and the outside of the inner sphere in the thunderstorm generator. So I'll leave you with that for the update. Um, there's significant evidence of plasma phenomena occurring within the spheres, and there's significant indication that the plasmoids are getting embedded within the structure of the metal, where they remain stable for long periods, potentially indefinitely. Not only does this begin to spectacularly verify Malcolm Bendel's initial claims about the thunderstorm generator and his plasmoid model, but it's also further verification of Bob Grenier and MFMP's own long-term research into plasmoid and ball lightning phenomena, uh, and builds on and supports the work of many others who've been investigating these phenomena in the past. So thanks again to Bob for his really fantastic work so far on verifying this and sharing it with us. And as usual, thank you to Malcolm Bendel, uh, who has been endlessly gracious in allowing open source researchers to get in there and examine his prototype um, and publish their data without reservation. Welcome to the age of thunderstorm technology. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more results and news as it comes in.